Good morning, good morning everyone. Raghu, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Deirdre. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for doing this. An exciting day for you. Uh, you've quintupled your valuation in how many months? Five months, which is crazy. You guys are now valued at $3.75 billion. Tell our audience what Falcon X is, what you guys do. Absolutely. First off, we're very excited and fortunate to be one of the most valuable institutional crypto companies. To your question, Deirdre, what is Falcon X? Falcon X is an institutional only one-stop shop for digital assets. And I'll parse that out. We serve institutions only, some of the world's largest hedge funds, venture funds, asset managers, payment processors, and retail aggregators use Falcon X. And for these providers or these institutions, we take care of all their digital asset needs all the way from, I need to find really good pricing. I want to get credit solutions wrapped around that pricing. I want to uh, move value from one point to another point. So we cover all these services for institutions anywhere on the planet. Now institutions, they also use some of the bigger platforms that retail investors are on, such as Coinbase and Binance as well. And I know that Binance has been coming under more and more scrutiny and you have seen institutions, banks, hedge funds, even payments companies yeah. sort of not use their platform. Have you guys um, seen inbound interest from some of these institutions that would typically use Binance, but want something perhaps a little more in line with regulations and compliance? Absolutely. Uh, that's a very good point, and we're seeing a massive movement there, Deirdre. So FalconX is a one-stop shop that sits on top of many of these liquidity platforms, like the Coinbase of the world. So as a result, institutions are coming to us for three things. First and foremost, they, do, they want really good pricing, not just from one venue. They want pricing from a network of hundreds of venues, and that is very important. The second thing, the regulatory and the compliance aspects are extremely important for institutions, especially traditional institutions. The third thing is all our services, the institutional workflow. Before Falcon X Deirdre, for you to set up and actually navigate digital assets, it's a few months at the very least. So with Falcon X, you can onboard incredibly fast. More importantly, you don't have to go to a lender. You don't have to go to an exchange like the Binance of the world and figure out where the pricing is, manage inventory. All of that is collapsed into a 120 second workflow. So that is what's exciting for institutions. So how do you do that? And what kind of fees do you guys pay versus an institution that can go on Coinbase, which is now you know a public company and you know regulated and sort of offering perhaps a similar product? How, how does it differ? So we work very closely with the Coinbase of the world, right? In fact, most major exchanges. How are we different? First and foremost, from a pricing standpoint, we, we don't charge any fee on top. We give you the bid ask and all our fees are baked into the bid ask. Why is that important? For a lot of institutions, they are, they are confused by all these different price points and different volume tiers and all of that. They're like, give me a price to buy or sell. And that's exactly what we provide in a very linear way. So do you guys work with Binance as well? We don't. And why is that? Part of the reason is they have one of the largest liquidity pools uh, you know, on the planet for sure. Part of it is the regulation and the compliance. But the good news is Binance US is taking a much more proactive approach and we have lines of connection there, Deirdre. What did you make of last week's announcement um, as they try to strengthen their regulatory chops and their compliance you know, <laughs> standards? What did you make of the CEO? Uh, Brian Brooks, Brooks leaving last week. That was uh, that was an interesting move. First off, on Binance, um, you know, looking and taking a much more proactive stance now in terms of regulation compliance. That's a welcome move for the industry. Why? We are sitting on top of a mega trend here, Deirdre. And what is a mega trend? I think tokenization of value is something that's super exciting to our investors and institutions that are coming in. What is tokenization of value? Can you imagine Google and Amazon working only five days a week? If you can, why are we all okay with our traditional financial infrastructure, your trading, your banking, working only five days a week? And blockchain for the first time proved at scale that these traditional uh, financial services can be provided 24 seven, truly global and much more accessible. And to your question, regulation is a very important component of this entire narrative. So we have to make sure that all players in this ecosystem comply with the local regulation. And that's very important for institutions. 
Raghu, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on in the crypto markets. We've seen Bitcoin really bounce back. And a lot of that has been the institutional interests, right? Those larger trades, they're not, they haven't really been spooked by the regulation, right? Yeah, that is fascinating. I mean, if you look at the underlying reasons for the recent uh, you know, bounce, uh, Deirdre, there is this time around, there is no one specific reason. We hear three reasons from institutions. The first and foremost, the user and user adoption is just, the growth has been incredible. For the first time, crypto users around the planet reached past 200 million user uh, point. And for an engineer and a product manager, that's a very important number. We are going from early adopters to mainstream adoption. The second thing, institutions are uh, getting access to digital assets much more seamlessly through players like Falconx. So the first uh, trend is the user adoption, which a lot of institutions are excited about. The second uh, thing is all the nuance and the discussion around uh, infrastructure bill with crypto amendments being proposed in the infrastructure bill, that's putting a lot of limelight. So most of our institutions believe that that limelight is going to like is making crypto as a major asset class. Hmm. Right? There is no discussion on the fringes anymore. Go ahead. So talk, talk a little bit about the infrastructure bill, which we've been talking a lot about on CNBC. And we're going to get a vote in just less than an hour from now. Results expected at around 8.30 PT, 11.30 ET. What are you hearing from institutions? There's obviously been a lot of blowback from the exchanges themselves and Bitcoin miners and the crypto industry. What are institutions saying about it? Yeah, there is so much chatter, so much passionate arguments on both sides from institutions, Deirdre. To summarize that, first and foremost, crypto taxation is a very important thing. That needs to be solved. It needs to have clarity, and that's important for institutions. For players like FalconX, we have the tools, we have the resources, and we have to know how to comply with it, comply with all the variations that are proposed. So it's not really just about FalconX. It's about the software developers. It's about the yeah. miners. Now, if you draw an analogy, right, I mean, the most conservative interpretation in the amendment, uh, what a, this is an analogy. In the early days of internet, if you were to say that all website uh, builders, like an average Joe building a website, has this burden of an enormous tax law on uh, his or her shoulders, it's going to uh, stifle the innovation quite a bit in an industry that's in the making. So from an innovation uh, perspective, it is very important to have sandboxes. It's very important to have the tax code accommodate uh, all the possible innovation, especially from developers and miners. So institutions, what we hear more broadly is taxation is welcome. Clarity is always good for institutions, but at the same time, uh, you know, fostering innovation in the newly emergent uh, asset class is extremely important for institutions. I've certainly heard that argument and that analogy, but the crypto industry is creative. They found ways around it and take a look at markets like India and China that have been far less friendly in terms mm -hmm. of their regulations. What are the stakes in this bill, whether that language gets changed or not in terms of innovation and the future of the industry here in the United States? Now that's an excellent point. A lot of institutions, right, US-based and in Asia, Deirdre, they look up to US regulation. US regulation is still the hallmark of how institutions behave in a new asset class. From that standpoint, the table stakes here are huge. Right. I mean, I was I was on a call at four o'clock this morning with an institution, uh, you know, from Asia. It's like, hey, what's going on with the infrastructure bill? What's the latest there? So they're all very keenly uh, observing. And this is the chance for the U.S. to uh, define the future of crypto and the taxation. So it's a great moment for the U.S. And I hope we get this right. Right. So it's interesting to me that you do not work with Binance. I want to ask you about some other perhaps controversial parts of the crypto market. One of those is stable coins and Tether now, you know, having such a huge function within the market. Do you guys, do institutions trade in Tether? So some institutions, especially institutions based out of uh, Asia, we see them trading with Tether. But more broad, broadly, Deirdre, to your point, um, is Tether bearing a lot of risk for uh, the cryptoverse? Possibly not. If you look at stable coins, the stable coin adoption has been tremendous over the last one year. It went from $5 billion to about $75 billion as of today in terms of stable coin market cap. Mm -hmm. But the important thing to notice here is all stable coins are very transactional. The yes. minute people find that like you know the, the under, underpinnings of a stable coin are not as solid, they migrate to the next stable coin relatively easily. 
Now, if you look at the breakdown of the $75 billion, $30 billion is Tether and $28 billion is USD. See, and all of that happened in a matter of few weeks. So because it's very transactional, I'm not as concerned about any one stable coin. Right. And that's that's fair. Do you think that and what are you hearing from institutions? Are they favoring something like USDC, which is thought to have better disclosures than a tether? Do you think that that tide is shifting? And we haven't seen any new tethers issued in you know a few months now, but we have seen USDCs issued. So off the stable coins, definitely USDC adoption is growing much, much faster. And why is that important, Deirdre? For a lot of institutions coming in, first, they come in because Bitcoin is an inflationary hedge. Um, and after that, they realize that it's a 24-7 market. And mm -hmm. why are we only five days? So they start using stable coins. And especially for institutions, US and also in Asia, it is very important to have a good, solid, transparent underpinning for it. So as a result, we are seeing a lot more engagement with USDC in the most uh, in the last one month compared to Tether. Interesting. Huh. Um, what are your thoughts on a central bank backed digital currency, especially as you guys are global and you see a country like China moving a little faster on this while the US sort of takes its time and debates it and looks at its use cases? Yeah, um, it's it's inevitability, Deidre. It's, it's going to happen. And like companies, countries are going to compete with launching very interesting variants of central bank issued digital currencies. The good news there is all of Falconx's technology can translate and render to CBDCs as seamlessly, as long as their uh, blockchain is involved in it. So to your point, we are going to see a plethora of CBDCs being issued. Now the question is, is it three years, is it five years, the timelines are fungible there. The second thing, CBDCs getting issued is very, very powerful for ecosystem. I think it'll also uh, ratify Bitcoin and Ethereum much more strongly because the minute you get into CBDCs, these assets closely uh, exist. That's, so I think for the industry, it is, it's going to be a huge welcome. Right. And you're talking about that function, again, that we see from stable coins and a function that we would get from central bank backed digital currencies. Last question for you, because we are running out of time. Um, where is Falcon X, you know, a few years from now? Are institutions going to be trading majority on Falcon X? Is there still a use case for Coinbase or do you displace some of those platforms? Yeah, that's fascinating. So in terms of looking at a little bit of our growth and then looking at where we're going, over the last one year, Deirdre, we've seen incredible growth. Our revenues grew 30 times and with very strong margin profile and unit economics. And we have been profitable for a long time now. And all of that is because institutions demand a much more institutionalized workflow. They don't want to go get credit somewhere, you know, uh, trade somewhere and then settle, uh, you know, pre-trade. All these nuances are making it very complex. So what we believe is, just like in the traditional world, the one-stop shops will interact very closely with exchanges, and it is going to be a very close partnership with the both. But I do believe a lot of institutions would want one-stop shop or brokerage-like services going forward, because that's how the traditional world evolved as well. So I lied. I have one more last question. What are your plans for going public, um, especially as you have a Coinbase now public and getting that exposure and that um sort of the regulatory chops as well. Is that something you're thinking about? You said that you've already been profitable for a few years. Yeah, I mean, with regards to the conversation around public or using other instruments, it really boils down to what our mission is. And what we are thinking about is, as institutions come into digital assets, we are at the forefront of it. And we want to make digital assets mainstream for every institution on the planet. And with that goal, whatever instrument facilitates for us to go global and expand the reach and scale our operations by 10x, we are considering. The great news is the investors that we have on the cap, cap table, we have one of the strongest cap tables uh, for any startup. So uh, investors like Ultimator, Sapphire, Tiger, and Bcap, they're very well versed with navigating public markets. Right. And they, they have been tremendously helpful in helping us think through public markets. So we are evaluating the era. We haven't made a decision yet. <laughs> evaluating could we expect something in the next year or so <laughs> i'll keep you posted for sure <laughs> <laughs> okay i tried i tried um Raghu, thank you so much for being with us excited to see what you guys do check back in with us often thank you so much likewise okay.